Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl podcast. This is episode 13, Istanbul's Grand Bazaar. Before I went to Istanbul, I was dreaming of the Hagia Sophia, but when I got there, I fell in love with the walls of Constantinople and the Grand Bazaar. This episode picks up where the walls of Constantinople episode laves off, with the emergence of one of Istanbul's Ottoman icons, the Grand Bazaar. My guest today is Christopher Mitchell. He's the travel blogger behind Traveling Mitch and the podcast miniseries Into Istanbul. We discuss how Mehmet II began construction of the Grand Bazaar shortly after conquering Constantinople, how it grew from two warehouses into the nearly 4,000 stall market there today, and how the bazaar has and has not changed over its nearly 600-year existence. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. My guest today is Chris Mitchell from Traveling Mitch. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Thank you for coming on. So the goal of today... A few weeks ago, we did a podcast episode about the walls of Constantinople, and that episode went all the way up to when the Ottoman Empire breached the walls of Constantinople, but we didn't really talk about Istanbul. So the goal of today is to talk about the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, but also modern Turkey and how Constantinople even turned into Istanbul and what the last 500 years was like. So I'm really excited to have Chris on today because you have actually been living in Istanbul. You just moved away. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about how you got interested in Istanbul? Yeah, sure. So for me, Istanbul is a place I always uh, wanted to go and knew I needed to go, being one of the great cities on our planet, especially historically. So in 2010, I had the chance to to visit and, and they really fell in love with it. And when I had the chance to move there in 2014, I took the opportunity. So 2014 to 2017, really just... Up until a few uh, months ago, I was living there, and um, yeah, it changed my life in, in all kinds of ways. I, I hold Istanbul pretty close to my heart. Now, you're a travel writer. Most people that we've had on are podcast history podcasters, but you did a podcast series about Istanbul called Into Istanbul, and what was the... Tell us a little bit about that show. I did that with the co-partner who was also a travel writer. We had a theme each week for Into Istanbul, so like Istanbul is home or Istanbul is funny, something like that. And we explored sort of the hidden stories of Istanbul, what home looks like for different people in Istanbul, depending on where you're from and, and what you're doing there or where. And at that time, obviously, things uh, were a bit difficult. So, you know, we were looking at uh, where people are finding sort of humor and reprieve in Istanbul at, at a difficult time. Yeah. So let's talk about the Grand Bazaar. The Grand Bazaar is one of the most touristed places in Istanbul. And it's, along with Topkapi Palace, probably the two places most people think of as purely Ottoman, because they really were the after the city became Istanbul. How did the Grand Bazaar begin? I mean, picking up where we sort of left off from that episode, the walls are breached in, uh, in 53, and basically right after that, they start to, to think about building the Grand Bazaar, the Kapula Charsha. So Kapula Charsha literally translates to closed market. And uh, apparently that relates to, to the fact that it's, it was a market that was opened up during the day. They opened up the gates, and, but closed it at night and guarded it. And some other people would believe that uh, Kapula would refer to the fact that it's a, it's a covered market. So basically 1455 is when they start building it. It's founded, so to speak, by Mehmet II, who's the famous ruler. I can tell you from, from living there, uh, his legacy very much lives on. It's Mehmet the Conqueror. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, there's, there's one sultan who conquered Istanbul, and, and that's Mehmet II, obviously. And the neighborhood is actually, so the neighborhood is called Sultan Ahmet, but it really is named after him. It's not, I always thought as a traveler there, it was like a derivative of Sultan, but it's not. It's just his name in Turkish is like yeah. what the whole area is called, Sul- now, right? Sultan Ahmed is literally Sultan Ahmed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's one of those things that's become sort of colloquialized, if you will, and become salt and, and to the fact, to the point where when I first moved there, a lot of people called it Sultan Ahmed. Yeah. You know, as opposed to Sultan Ahmed. 
Yeah, so it's, so, I mean, it's right in the heart of the action. Um, and that's where most tourists would stay, would be in Sultanahmet, because you have the Hagia Sophia and the, and the Blue Mosque, and you have the Basilica Cistern. And of course, I was more situated in the, in the modern city, in an area called Osmanbe, but I would tell most people to stay around there. You know, mentioning the Hagia Sophia, it's sort of significant to mention that Mehmet II basically initiates the construction of a, what's called a, a bedestan or a warehouse, which he's sort of gifting to the to the people of. Basically, it's an Islamic designation known as a waqf. And essentially, it's, it's a, a structure or something which is gifted to the people, but it has a sort of a, a pious twist to it. So in this, what I mean by that, in this instance, Mehmet II is he's building this, and the proceeds from that market, from this warehouse, are essentially going to go to the construction of the Hagia Sophia. So it's sort of like he's contributing to the to the city for the greater good for everybody in the construction of the mosque. And when they, when you say the construction of the Hagia Sophia, obviously it was there before, but there, this is the actual process where it went from a Orthodox church to a mosque was funded by the proceeds from the Grand Bazaar. Right, that was the uh, that was the intention. At least I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they sort of pulled funds from other areas too. But that was definitely the idea. And yeah, as you mentioned, so obviously the Hagia Sophia used to be the what was the main Orthodox church period, really, until the city is taken. So one interesting thing to to note is that there was talk apparently around that time of just demolishing the church as a sort of a I mean, that would certainly be a power play of sorts to, <laughs> to, to knock down the quintessential um, Orthodox church anywhere on the planet. But the story goes that it was so, so moved by the structure itself that they decided that they would put their own spin on it, essentially. And so they remove all the, the, the great symbols of Orthodox Christianity, and they go as far as destroying the relics, destroying everything, and then they get to work and plastering over things, and they get to work uh, building the minarets and turning it into a mosque, and obviously a pretty good idea because... It saved yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it saved it. And also, I mean, you look across, uh, right across from it, you have the what's known as the Blue Mosque, obviously, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous mosque, but there's a certain unique nature to the Hagia Sophia that could only be from being built upon another church, really, in essence. Well, and the Blue Mosque is still a mosque today. And if you go, you should definitely visit the Blue Mosque. It's beautiful. But that experience is the experience of visiting a mosque. And I believe very strongly, especially for anyone who maybe didn't grow up Muslim, and if you're traveling around the world, that you really should go visit houses of worship that are open, and you should visit them respectfully, but that you should go in and see them. But when you go into the Hagia Sophia now, it's a museum because they Turkey turned it back into a museum. I just when I was in Istanbul, I didn't know the history of the Grand Bazaar, so I didn't realize how the Grand Bazaar was tied into these other historic places. It seemed to me like, oh, it's just the place that you go to buy carpets, but really, it's a central part of Ottoman life at the time, and it makes sense that it was one of the first big construction projects initiated by. Mehmet after he conquered the city. So when did, did it get up and running? And what was it like to go there in the early days? Like who was going there? What was the experience like? Because I'm sure they weren't selling knockoff Chanel purses like they are now. <laughs> yeah, no, not quite. Right after 55 is when it's initiated, but it's really up and running in the 1460s. And this Bedestan is known as um, Jevahir Bedestan, which is like sort of warehouse of gems. Um, <laughs> the and, warehouse of gems. Yeah, but it's, yeah, exa <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're not, uh, no modesty there. But it should be mentioned also that it was apparently also known as the Bezazistani Jadid, which is Ottoman for uh, like new warehouse, okay. sort of. So it, it could be either or. Right. So it, it sort of takes off quickly and becomes this center of trade. And it's simple, the, where it is situated is like the center of the world at that point in time for trade because it's it's on the Bosphorus. You have it's the only way to get to the Black Sea. So all of those goods and the whole reason that you would want to own Istanbul is to have the spot on the Bosphorus. And the Grand Bazaar is where all those goods is one of the main places all those goods are coming through, especially for people in the city. Yeah, it's basically becomes a place where they're showing off what they're 
gathering from the rest of the uh, the empire, but also it becomes a place where people are traveling from all around to come there. You have accounts from people as early as I want to say the early 17th century and even before that of of French uh, explorers or people you know involved in in uh, high level politics who are coming to visit and are extremely impressed by what's going on there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what the actual structure of the Grand Bazaar is? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, you have this this one warehouse, essentially, which it quickly becomes evident that that's not going to be enough for what they need. It's not the Grand Bazaar yet, but it becomes the Grand Bazaar pretty shortly. So what happens is uh, Mehmet II sort of sees that they're outgrowing this Bedestan, and he constructs another one. And this is called the Sandal Bedestan, and it's called the Sandal Bedestan because it's a, it's named after a thread that's woven in Bursa. Bursa is about a two-hour ferry ride now, but it would be a little bit longer back then. It was also uh, known as the Kachuk or Yeni Benesen. Kachuk, small, Yeni, new. So I should also note there's some confusion about whether it was Mehmet II who constructed this other Benesen or a later sultan. But generally speaking, people would agree that he had built this second one. And the first one is supposed to deal with higher-end luxury goods. And this new Bedestan is supposed to deal with more of the textile trade, which um, Turkey obviously becomes pretty yeah. famous for. And it's hard still, to go to Istanbul without being try- someone trying to sell you a carpet. Right. I mean, I know I didn't leave without, uh, without <laughs> buying a carpet either, right? So this becomes the true center of commerce, not just for Istanbul, but for the nation and really for the Ottoman Empire. So... What happens is you have these two warehouses and people see opportunity and other shops start sort of setting up around these warehouses and sort of filling in the gaps to the point where these two warehouses essentially become the true center of commerce for the country and for the Ottoman Empire at large. Now, in the early 1600s is where you start to see the present shape of of the Grand Bazaar. So we have something like 3,000 shops. And if you put that in perspective, there's something like 4,000 shops today. So, oh, wow. so already back then you have this just, I mean, it would have been at the time unimaginable amounts of, of trading. Now commerce. the shops are pretty small. Are the shops at the time the same, like little 10 by 10 stalls? Apparently they were already, that those sizes were yeah. already allocated, which is why really a lot of, of what we think about is the couple of Charsha now is you start to see a pretty close resemblance. But I should mention, you know, I talked about two arrows just slowly filling in. That's really where these covered laneways or streets come into Because they're between play. the buildings right. that were built. Okay, right. that makes and sense. And so now there's something like 61 streets. I think at that time there was something like 67 streets. It would have been a little bit more disorganized. But these shops start to become more organized. They become covered, which is why some people think Kapula Charsha refers to, to that. But then this becomes this monstrosity, right? <laughs> like it really becomes the, the grand it's bazaar. It's huge. You walk in and you just get lost. And it is very easy to come out on the other end and not really understand where you are. So when I was there in 2011, it was the very first time I ever saw anyone using Google Maps in the real world, like to get around was on this trip to Istanbul, but I didn't have that on my phone on my, like, I don't think I had internet on my phone at the time. So I was very lost. And then when I came to visit you in Istanbul in May of this mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. we did all the modern stuff. We didn't go back and do a Sultan Ahmed at all. So I got to go back to the Grand Bazaar. I don't know when my visa situation is going to be okay, but I got to go back. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to go back any time to Istanbul. Yeah, so I'm an American, and right now, uh, within the last week, Turkey has announced they're not issuing visas to Americans, and the really terrible thing is I actually have three more months of a visa from when I visited you, but I don't know where that visa is, because I thought, oh, when I go back, I'll just buy another $20 visa, and you're Canadian, so you can still go back Mm -hmm. whenever you want. Yeah, yeah, I mean, (laughs) uh, it's an interesting time for... For Turkey, and I, I love the country with all my heart, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a bit it can be a bit rocky at times. I have some friends there, obviously, who who are American or a bit concerned, but I think they have their TT visas and stuff set up though, right? They're good. Yeah, but I mean, with reapplications and stuff, yeah. they're not sure how things are going to go. But the people there in general are extraordinarily resilient, and I find that people are generally like, you know what? 
it's going to be okay. Somehow this is going to all work out. So yeah. that's sort of the attitude I've adopted with the, the city in general. It's, you know, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Yeah. So I need to go back and see the Grand Bazaar again because it's so, but getting back to the history of it. So in this 17th century, it's already starting to look like it does today. How does it change progress over like the 18th and 19th century as the Ottoman Empire expands in power and then as it starts to weaken in power? Yeah. As you can imagine, as the Ottoman Empire begins to grow, you have this situation where the the market continues to take on more and more importance. And it's the hub of trading for this expanding and growing empire. So you've got manufacturers there and you've got traders there and then you've got guilds being uh, founded there. Uh, I should mention that there are mosques there there are fountains there are mosques in the inside Mm -hmm. the grand bazaar Mm -hmm. even though it's across the street from two other mosques yeah there's never enough mosques of course i did get that from turkey that there are a lot more mosques per square mile Mm -hmm. than i've seen anywhere else in the world even in like there were more than in amman by like a lot yeah well for pragmatic purposes too you know if if the call to prayer happens and you happen to be in the in the grand bazaar even nowadays you want to be able to go to a mosque and it helps having a mosque in the grand bazaar so really, so as I was mentioning, you have this, it's growing and it's growing and it's becoming more and more important. And I mentioned before, but these gates closing, I think there was 18 gates. By this time, we're talking about 30 hectares, give or take, is the size of the market. Before long, you have soldiers which guard the gates at night. I think there was something like 100, 100 or potentially hundreds of soldiers who would, all the gates would close for the night and the soldiers would be outside guarding it because... I think at this point, it becomes more than a market. It becomes a symbol of Ottoman control and, and dominance, right? Because you have, you know, Ottoman products and things like that there. But uh, you're also getting a fair bit from all over, you know, the Ottoman Empire and world in general. And I think it's an attestation to the empire itself that they can, you know, you can find these things in Istanbul because we're so powerful. Yeah. You so know, they're trading with the Venetians. They're trading with... Russians, are tra- they're trading with everyone, and those goods are coming into the Grand Bazaar. And so people in Istanbul are able to get goods that people in other cities can't get. In the way that, like, the spice trade changes how England feels about itself later. Right, yeah. I think it's predominantly Turkish goods in that. But I think the other thing, too, is with the importance of the Ottoman Empire rising, you have more people who want to come and see this epicenter of, of Ottoman goods as well. As this empire grows and and really the prestige of the empire grows, you know, somebody from what we call Western Europe now, you know, you see that these empires, old, old empires, which are looking over thinking like we, the Ottoman Empire deserves our respect. So you have people kind of coming over. It would become increasingly chic to have something from the Ottoman Empire in your, in your place, you would imagine, yeah. right? Well, and even through the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire is still, that's, that's when it's like, attacking Vienna, that's when it's kind of at its peak. And then over the next 200 years, it's consolidating power, but not as expanding as much. It's still very wealthy. Yeah. And of course, though, you mentioned there is a bit of a, there is a downturn. (laughs) So the 19th century, as somebody living in Bulgaria, I know the 19th century is when it lost a lot of the Balkans and it didn't lose all of it, but it, so the Russo-Turkish War, Bulgaria became free in the second half of the 19th century from Ottoman rule and a lot of the other Balkan countries too. I know Greece wasn't free yet, I don't think. How is that affecting Istanbul and in turn, how is that affecting the Grand Bazaar? Right. So obviously when you're losing wars and losing territory, you're, you're losing esteem. And that's what happened to the Ottoman Empire. So a lot of historians around that time talk about you know this time with a basically losing more and more land from from Greece, from Bulgaria, the Balkans, Egypt, etc. They talk about Istanbul as a, as a city with a faded glory. So I would you know have to imagine that you're not seeing the, the shop sellers maybe as, as boisterous and, and proud of Ottoman of what they're offering of Ottoman heritage. I have to imagine there's some sense of uh, maybe not trying to sell off what they have, but definitely um, Definitely, this there was there was 100% a cloud over over the fate of Istanbul, and not necessarily the fate of the city getting into someone else's hands, but more just they there would have been a sense that Istanbul might have reached its pinnacle and be on the other side of that, and that would have been reflected uh, in commerce and and considering the Grand Bazaar 
is you know what I described as in a lot of ways the epicenter for the Ottoman Empire. Obviously, it's going to have some effect on it. I think a lot of people, when they think of Istanbul, they know it started in the 15th century with the fall of Constantinople. I think they have a concept that World War I was kind of the end of the Ottoman Empire. But I don't know how much of modern Turkish history people really understand. I feel like it's highlights. It's World War I, it's Ataturk. What is happening to Turkey and Istanbul from like the late 19th century through the 20th century? The highlight there, and, and something which is definitely a part of Turkish lore, really, is, you mentioned it briefly, but it is Ataturk is, is the center of what we're talking about there. And Ataturk comes in, for those who don't know, and he really pushes the idea of forming a secular republic. I think at this time, the Ottoman Empire is sort of finished, but they don't really know what the next step is. And it's, it is Ataturk who takes the flag. When does he come, like, what, what decade is he coming to power in? So it would have been the early to mid 20s. So like right after. So mm-hmm. what happens between World War One and Ataturk? Is it just chaos? Tur- tur- yeah, turmoil. Okay. He's known for not being so sort of obedient. He's known for being a bit of a young gun who's really not great at obeying the people who are commanding him in World War One. But the truth is when he's given the opportunity to show valor and brilliance, he's almost always on the ball. And if I'm correct, he made some really daring moves in, uh, in Gallipoli, on the, on the coast there, with the Anzac troops. And okay. I'm not positive about that, but that's where I believe he, was really, he really esteemed himself. But he, uh, he really takes the, the mantle and gets himself into power and gets you know, fairly widespread support. But he's also controversial at that time because he's moving away from this heavily... Islamic nation of the past and he wants to become a secular nation which is focused on research and development and focused on um, moving forward in the future. He, his idea is, okay, we're catching up with our neighbors and he'll do that at any cost. And he does little things. He basically gets rid of the Fez. You know, oh, okay. so, so the reason that, you know, the Fez, which is really only used in like Souvenir really, shops? Yeah, exactly. But like you don't really see people. Before that, people are wearing them all okay. over. But he sort of says, like, no, 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 like, we're done with this past. We're looking to the future. He puts the, the country on his back and moves forward. How do places like the Grand Bazaar and Tukapi Palace, these other places that are symbols of Ottoman rule, what is Turkey under Ataturk? What are their attitudes towards these places? Because they obviously got preserved. I think it's, it's a fine balance. Ataturk was walking a very fine line because he knew that obviously Ottoman history was going to be important to the future. And he knew that these structures were going to be important to the future, but he was just adding in his own touches, sprinkling his own uh, essence, if you will. So think about Domobace Palace, for example. That's not a classically Ottoman structure, yet it's a beautiful structure aesthetically, but it's taking some ideas from European nations and it's built on the shores. And so I think he was smart in many ways by, I think he glorified what he had to about the past, but just kept people very focused on the future. And so I, I guess a place like the Grand Bazaar, well, at the very least, they, the Fez sales went down. <laughs> um, but but um, I, I'm guessing there would, have been, there would be a, you know, a shift in what they were selling. If you go from a Islamic nation to a secular nation just like that, the biggest place of trade and sale, you're going to shift a little bit into what you're selling. So I've traveled a lot over the former Ottoman Empire. And in a lot of cities, there are these old Ottoman bazaars. And some of them are closed down and turned into other structures. And some of them are still open. How did the Grand Bazaar stay open? And how did it become more of a tourist destination? Because it's not the market that most locals would go to anymore, even if it was back in the day. Yeah. I mean, they did a really brilliant job of marketing as like, the <laughs> c- really, I think in the, as the center of like, I remember when I first went to, to, uh, to Istanbul in 2010, it's just something I knew I had to go. I, I knew I had to go there. Right. Because that's where the, the, the essence of Turkey still lies. And I, I don't mean that actually in the products. I mean that in the people, the shopkeepers there and the sellers there are just incredible. They have that boisterous and upbeat Turkish nature. And they're keeping a tradition alive that... Yeah, that 
And like in Cyprus, so there's markets in Cyprus, there's markets in Greece, there's markets in Bulgaria, but they're not really the Ottoman Empire anymore. They're mm-hmm. not, they're, they're more just like, this is an old Ottoman place, but we're selling Cypriot goods here. And mm-hmm. this is, you mm-hmm. know, but in the Grand Bazaar, they're really keeping the tradition of like our empire alive. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a beautiful microcosm for the city itself because you have, it's pure chaos. You, you, <laughs> you need to have your haggling skills on top notch. Everyone's fueled by chai, you know, Turkish tea. There's people whipping through the hallways with trays of tea that you're positive are going to spill, but just don't. Oh, I, that's one of the things I love the most about traveling in the Middle East and in Turkey is the, the guys taking, it's like, okay, so here, not here, but like most, you know, in America, you order like Postmates or Grubhub and someone brings you a pizza and there people call and they're just like, please bring us tea. And it's like Mm -hmm. a 14 year old boy bringing a tray of tea, like as fast as he possibly can down the street, which Mm -hmm. is just one of the cool, like you have to see it when you see it, you know, you're not in North America anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was also going to say, I mean, you talk about this sort of this tourism lure. It was actually, I think in 2014, it was listed as the number one place for, for tourists in the city. So I think it, it was getting something like 400,000 visitors a day. Oh my gosh. Which it feels like that when you're, yeah, when you're in there. It's, it's huge and completely crowded mm-hmm. and you're haggling over Turkish delight mm-hmm. or something or knockoff prices or everything you could think you'd ever want to buy is for sale there. And one thing I will note though, and I wrote about this during my time in Istanbul about the Grand Bazaar is that things changed a bit and, uh, from 2014 to now. I, I don't know the specific numbers, but there's no way that that many people are going to the Grand Bazaar anymore. Because people aren't going to Turkey as much anymore? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, the tour, tourism's way down in Turkey. Also, unfortunately, there were a number of incidents in the city involving explosions and things like that, and I think that permeated the media in a way which made people very paranoid. Um, and I think paranoid tourists are probably not going to want to go to, to a extremely busy covered market. Yeah. Um, and then there hasn't been an incident in modern history in modern tourist history there or anything like that. But, um, I will say in the three years that I was there tourism, there were a lot of sites where I would go, which would be packed, would have been packed in 2014. They were just not in 2017. And the grand bazaar is, is, is one of those sites. And I think unfortunately the people who are there are really feeling it. I've been to the Grand. I was at the Grand Bazaar, let's say, just a handful of months back, and I have some shop owners who I know there, and some restaurant owners and things like that. And they're, you know, we were speaking Turkish together, and they're telling me, you know, like, yeah, things are really bad. You know, I'm not sure where things are headed, but sales are way down, um, and so you get a bit of a situation where people are trying harder to sell things, um, and that's in turn probably letting people, leading people out of the market because they don't want to be. Sort of bombarded, but, but, much, yeah. but people are, yeah, so it's I felt it's that tough. in Jordan, too. Um, tourism in Jordan is down, and I felt overly pressured to buy things when I was there. And you could just tell that it was, that people are really, really needed the money, and they were really going to work for everything. It can get a little bit tiring. As a tourist, honestly, it can be a little bit tiring to be in those situations. And sometimes it's good just to have headphones or know the Turkish word for no. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> higher, higher. Higher. Yeah, so on the episode about Petra, Jay Taylor taught us how to say no in Arabic, and so you will tell us how to say no in Turkish. When I was at the Grand Bazaar, I did spend a lot of money there. That is the place in Turkey where I ended up spending a little bit of money, because mm-hmm. it was really fun shopping there. In a way that it is not super fun to go to a mall, and it's like you go to the mall to buy stuff because you have to buy something, but it's easier to just order it on Amazon. There are places around the world where the retail experience is the experience and the Grand Bazaar is a place that you should go to shop specifically. Mm-hmm. It's really fun. And you, you can be a bit of an actor, just learn a few words really well. A hire, obviously, it can be no. You can say, like, a lot of heavy breathing really have, like, like, just can't do it. You, can, <laughs> you know, um, if you want to say something that's really expensive, chok pahala. <laughs> you know, really just give, give them that. Or, you know, if you say, you know, can you give a discount? Indirim Yuparmasin, that can help, you know, can you give me a bit of a discount? And it doesn't hurt that you speak Turkish. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. It, doesn't <laughs> hurt. it, it helps me a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So 
part of why I wanted to have you on is because I think people are curious about what's going on there now. And we'll talk mm-hmm. about that in a minute. Is there anything else from the history of the Grand Bazaar that we would want to make sure to mention? Well, one thing I will mention, actually, which I, I just thought about now, is it's the Grand Bazaar is right beside Sultanahmet, but it technically is in the district of Fatih. Okay. And Fatih is known as a very sort of a very religious uh, uh, Islamic district. So it should also stipulate that the Grand Bazaar still, uh, especially nowadays, is really carrying on a lot of the um, Islamic Ottoman traditions. Um, um, when I mentioned um, Ataturk, um, and his move towards secularism, um, a lot of the tumult you're seeing in Istanbul now as a result of things moving back in the other direction. Um, things are becoming increasingly more conservative and traditional. And so it'd be interesting to see the way that, that affects the, you know, what's being sold and things like that in the Grand Bazaar. But I think ultimately I just would really strongly recommend that if you are in Istanbul, um, you should definitely go to the Grand Bazaar because, um, there are a lot of really, those shopkeepers there are really good people. Really, really, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. You, you go there with your, your haggling hat on and the products there, you, you could find some magnificent goods there. You know, the colors there, if you yeah. go to some, some of the sections with plates and, and, you know, I don't know if we mentioned that, uh, the way it essentially works is you have all of the shopkeepers from sort of one subsect are all in the same area. So you have like a jewelry section and a carpet section and a plate section. And, a, you know, and, and so I would recommend it's going to take you half a day or a day, or it could even take you a few days, but go and explore. Um, there's ways that you can get up on the roof. There's ways that you oh, can. Really? Did I know? I don't know if I did that. And there's like beautiful courtyards. There are, I don't know if you would. It's a whole world. It's a whole world. Yeah. 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 It's, I don't know if I mentioned the number, but I think it's like 30 hectares or something like that. 50 50 something square, 50,000 something square meters. It's, it's in total. I think now there's 61 operating streets and 18 gates. So you have, you can imagine what you can find in there. But the, the truth is like anything that I really enjoyed about Istanbul, you can find in some version there, you know, the, the boisterous, the warm, boisterous people, good quality tea, great Turkish food. Um, the lanes are going to be a bit emptier right now, but you know, it was too crowded in a period of time. So, yes. well, so. and so what I'm thinking of, there are places that are a lot like this. So like, uh, we were in Jerusalem March. in March, mm-hmm. and the the old, especially the like Islamic section or the Muslim section of uh, the old city feels a lot like this too. But it, this is, I think, this is a lot bigger. I'm not one hundred percent, but it comes from the same tradition. If anybody has been to Jerusalem and been to the Muslim quarter of the old city, this is going to feel a lot like that. Yeah, but larger on a larger scale. The Grand Bazaar in particular is one of the oldest and largest markets on the planet. So by any standard in any city you have, it, it is massive. But also the area around that Fatih and Sultanahmet, I've yet to see an area like that anywhere. And I think that's probably the majesty of Istanbul is, is it's so unique. I mean, it's the center of an empire that expands. So you have other places which take, you know, for example, I can think of maybe uh, parts of... Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina or, you know, parts of other places which touch the Ottoman Empire, which have these elements where you think, okay, the Ottoman Empire has been here, you know, for better or for worse, obviously. But Istanbul is the center of yeah. that. And it's it's all spilling out from there. So when you go to these places that have this sort of watered down Ottoman nature, you one could argue that the Grand Bazaar would be where you find the least diluted sort of yeah. Ottoman serum. And I love... I love traveling around the old Ottoman Empire. It is a fluke of the way that I planned my travels that I ended up going to Cyprus, Greece, Bulgaria, all around the Balkans. And you see, like, like there is a tiny village in a strange part of Bosnia called Srpska, which is its own independent republic inside of Bosnia. And there is an Ottoman bridge there. And I stayed in this town for two days just to see this Ottoman bridge because this bridge is a UNESCO World Heritage Site when you get into Istanbul, it's insane. And I think I was lucky that I saw Istanbul before I saw these other places. So I could, I could put them into perspective, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm really bummed about not being, cause I, there are so many places in Turkey I haven't been to yet. And I really hope they, I really hope knock on Ikea plexiglass or plexi. It's wood Yeah. It's wood pulp. Um, 
I really hope they get this figured out because Turkey is an amazing place to travel and the people are amazing. And I don't want to be held accountable for every decision that my government makes either. And I wouldn't hold that the people of of Istanbul or Turkey wouldn't hold it against the people that our governments Mm -hmm. are in a spat right now. Why don't you, why don't you talk a little bit about what modern Istanbul is like? Cause there are other parts of the city that are amazing too. Yeah, definitely. You've opened up a, a can of worms there because I have plenty I could say. But, <laughs> Let's, uh, let, I mean, no one to say everything, but like what, for somebody who's going to go to Istanbul mm-hmm. on a Canadian passport or a UK passport mm-hmm. it, or an American down the road mm-hmm. and they're going because they love history and they want to see Sultanahmet and they want to see the Hagia Sophia and, and they're going to go to the Grand Bazaar. What other pieces of Istanbul should they not leave without seeing that maybe isn't even on their horizon? Yeah, so I, I could offer a few suggestions there. So one thing, uh, if, especially for the history lovers out there, is the area of Balat, which is the old Jewish neighborhood. Um, it's an incredible neighborhood, and it's unlike anything else you'll find in Istanbul. And not far from Balat is the Chora Church, which is an old an old church with, with um, Greek Orthodox murals and things inside, which are spectacular. Um, so those two things, and then the, the Byzantine walls are around there. That's one thing you should check out. The modern city itself is worth checking out in, in as far as, I, mean, I think, Taksim uh, in general. If you go to Taksim Station, um, it's on the decline a little bit. It's a, a lot less busy than it was. But walking down Istiklal, which Istiklal Jadesi, which means Freedom Street, walking from the top of, of Istiklal all the way down to Shishane Station, which is right in the Galata neighborhood, and you have the Galata Tower, um, if you have a day, I would honestly walk down from Galata and head towards the Galata Bridge where you'll see fishermen who are living their, their daily lives, you know, cigarettes in mouth and tea in hand <laughs> and, you know, fishing around over the shoulder. And if you walk from there, you're going to get over to an area called Karakoy. Karakoy uh, used to be an area which was in like sincere disrepair because it was where a lot of the ships landed and basically sailors would just come off and like bedlam would ensue and then they get back on the boat. But now it's really cool. It's, it's sort of gentrified in the, hopefully the right way, if, <laughs> if there is such a thing. And a really, really cool cafes and bars. The other thing I would recommend, and this is, this is the thing I think too many people are leaving out, is um, there's areas which are right on the water, which are phenomenal for, for breakfast and stuff like that, especially. Bebek is one area which is right by uh, one of the bridges. Which is, is that where we had Turkish breakfast? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's where we had oh, Turkish breakfast. The, literally the best meal I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. Was May, like May 15th, 20th, whatever day I was there. <laughs> yeah. And it was this meal and it was insane. Yeah. It, yeah. How many how many dishes do you think were on the table at any one time? 25. And only one of them was not delicious. <laughs> like they literally hand you 25 plates. And one of them is like, clotted cream honey and a roll another one is like an omelet uh men and men which men and men's the classic <laughs> dish that you have Grilled tomato and, and, oh my egg gosh. And, and then there was one that was just like unflavored liver and that was the one where we were like <laughs> nah we'll pass on this one. yeah that's not a classic uh, breakfast dish but it, it appears sometimes so if people are planning a trip to istanbul you just did a really great episode of amateur traveler which mm-hmm. is a podcast that everyone who travels should check out whenever, before you go anywhere, go get the amateur traveler episode. I did an episode for him about Sofia, which all of my recommendations for someone coming to Bulgaria, if you're going to Sofia, but you just did one about a symbol. That's really good. So you literally laid out like a seven day itinerary mm-hmm. of stuff people should see. So we'll put a link in the show notes to that and to your website yeah. and also to um, the article that you wrote about the grand bazaar. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. So that people can find it. And then, is there anything people should know about Istanbul if they're going to go now? Like, what are some good tips? Because I think history lovers want to go there so bad. And I think it's hard for history lovers to know what the balance is between safety that's real and safety that's just listening to your parents being worried and is not legitimate, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, so it's a bit difficult to say. And I think I, I've always, you know, distrusted people who speak in definites about Istanbul because it's it's an ever-changing city. But I can say from living there for three years, and I always felt like the headlines were, were a bit misleading. I mean, definitely misleading. But um, there was a period, of course, last December and January where things were, were, were tough. But um, it's rebounded since then. There has not been anything recently going on. I mean, with visas and things, there's some complications. But all that to say, 
I think if we start to live our lives as travelers, thinking about all the things that could go wrong in a place, it's going to be a difficult time to travel for all of us. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I agree. I think that the world seems scarier partially because of social media and internet and that you can just know so much more about a place than you could 10 years ago. But it's also what makes it safer because when you get there, you can Google map your way out of a bad neighborhood in a way that maybe you couldn't 10 years ago either. Yeah. And one thing I'll note as well, well, practical tips, I would, Uber is really cheap there. Uh, especially you can take Uber XLs, which are big vehicles. If you have a small party of people and that's great because cab drivers are notorious for ripping you off as tourists. So that's one practical tip. But I will say the, one thing which I think is just too often overlooked is that the, the warmth of the Turkish people. And I think there's such a diversity of beliefs and understanding, in, in, even among neighborhoods, you know, that it's worthwhile for you to, to explore and to actually get to know the Turkish people because they're incredibly warm, kind. And I think it's, you know, in as much as uh, these headlines are coming up, I think the, a lot of these Turkish, these these people who have been living there and their families have been living there forever, they also feel like, you know, they're worried that the that their city is being classified as a place that's, you know, no longer inhabitable almost. Do you know what I mean? And, and the truth is that I have friends who are still there, tons of friends who are still there. Um, and I see them out on the boats in the Bosphorus and I see people enjoying their lives there and out for breakfast and up on the Galata Tower and all that stuff. And I think Istanbul still has a lot left to give and, and you'll find many people willing to give it to you, whether that's just the shop owner who fills up your chai, you know, without asking for anything else. Or, I mean, I think you just find over and over and over again examples of people who are looking out for you, you know, especially if you, if you speaking Turkish, that, that actually, that's, I'm going to have a tie right here, but honestly, that would be mm-hmm. the biggest thing. Learn a little bit of Turkish before you go. There are people or I can't possibly explain how much my Turkish helped me. Mm-hmm. Just the initial interaction, people were like, oh, this person cares, you know, because there's going to be less English there than you think. There, yeah. there will be. I had I had no problems with not speaking Turkish, but I was in Sultanahmet. Well, my first time I was in Sultanahmet. The second time I was with you mm-hmm. and your awesome fiance Brie. Hi, Brie. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if she'll listen to this episode, but she's super. We're cool. gonna make her listen to the episode yeah, now. Yeah, Be like hi, hi, Brie. <laughs> so um, I was with you guys, and you guys speak Turkish, and so I don't know what the language barrier would have been without you all there, and then. Mm-hmm. And I like to, you got to come back on and we got to do the Bordekoy Mosque, which is mm-hmm. one of the most beautiful mosques mm-hmm. in the world. We'll do that down the road. But mm-hmm. um, you can also talk Cappadocia, Ephesus. Yeah, I got to go there first before I can. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so my thing is that I don't do a place until I've been there because that makes me go places. So mm-hmm. uh, cool. Like it makes me reach out. Just say the word. Yeah. Great to be on. Ah, thank you so much. So how can people find you? So, um, you can find me at, uh, travelingmitch.com, one L for Canadian, uh, listeners of which there probably aren't that many, but hopefully there are. There, I think about a third of the audience is Canadian. So Beautiful. we got a lot of Canadians. Hello to my fellow Canadians. <laughs> Much love. Could you hear it in his voice? I could. <laughs> could you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you can find me there or at traveling Mitch, one L on any social media platform. Um, yeah, that's really how you can find me. Cool. Yeah. I got a Facebook page. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Pinterest, I'm on Instagram, you name it, I'm on it. And you're in Sofia because we were at a conference in Ireland mm-hmm. and we're going on a two week press trip to Romania <laughs> yep. starting on Friday. Mm-hmm. So you should definitely check out his Instagram and my Instagram, which is History Van Girl, if you want to see some awesome rural Romania pictures because we're going to have Tons. a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good thing to get along so well because we're going to be, yeah. It's really. Traveling is great. Like uh, people ask me, like, don't you get lonely? And it's like the first six months. Yeah. But then you just, after about six months, you have started to meet so many people that mm-hmm. you're never in a city by yourself. And then it actually becomes a problem because you never get any work done because <laughs> you're always hanging out with people. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, the other problem too, I mean, it, this is a, not a real problem, but like in the travel blogging sphere, whenever you go somewhere, you're sort of posting about it. And so when you, when you go to, when you go to a city and you know, you know, somebody there, there's not really a way they're not going to know you're there. Yeah. So you, you, you sort of have to reach out preemptively and be like, by the way, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there if you want to hang out. But I actually really need to like work. So like, let's this hang out like, like during very specific hours. Dinner, but no longer than 120 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm so glad I got to show you a little bit about Sophia too. I had to do some more Sophia episodes just right now. There's just one up on Real and Monastery, which 
is one of the most, you've been to Rail Monastery. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. one of the coolest places. I love it there. Yeah. I love it there. Well, uh, yeah, so check us out for some Romania stuff. Go to Istanbul unless you have an American passport, in which case we'll wait together. I think it's going to be, a, I think it'll be lifted in a few weeks. I think they'll figure feeling. it out. That's my feeling. And as soon as they lift it, I'm going to buy a ticket because I'm not going to wait. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. I want to say thank you again to Chris for coming on the show and sharing the history of this magnificent place and chatting about the state of tourism in Turkey today. For those who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much to those of you who've taken the time to rate and review the show. If you haven't yet and want to help the show out, it would be wonderful if you'd rate and review in iTunes. Every review makes the show more visible in the iTunes store for new listeners to find. The prize this week is a $20 Amazon gift card. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on the blog post for this episode, which you can find in the show notes. Good luck.